Guten Morgen und herzlich willkommen beim Auftakt des Frühjahrsprogramms der Dorfuni. Mein Name ist David Steinwender und ich werde diesen Vormittag heute moderieren. Die, das heutige Thema ist von einer besonderen Wichtigkeit und wir haben deswegen uns entschlossen, nicht nur auf Deutsch diese Veranstaltung zu machen, sondern auch uns an ein englisches Publikum zu wenden. Wir übersetzen gewisse Phasen simultan und andere schrittweise konsekutiv. Deswegen wechsle ich kurz ins Englische, um auch unsere Englischsprachigen zu begrüßen. Good morning and welcome to the start of the spring program of the Village University. My name is David Steinwender and I will moderate this session. Today's topic is of special importance, so we have decided to offer this kickoff not only to the German speaking audience, but also to the English. We will translate certain phases simultaneously and others step by step consecutively. In the beginning we switch consecutively between the languages and throughout this morning you don't have to change the channel. Mit unserem zweisprachigen Auftritt möchten wir uns auch an unser internationales Publikum wenden und es dazu animieren, ähnliche Initiativen wie die Dorfuni auch in anderen Ländern durchzuführen. Auch wenn abseits der beiden Redner ein starker Fokus auf Österreich liegt, bin ich davon überzeugt, oder sind wir davon überzeugt, dass es auch in anderen Ländern genauso Expertinnen aus der Theorie und der Praxis gibt wie bei uns. With our bilingual presentation, we also want to encourage our international audience to follow similar initiatives as the Village University for their communities. Even if, apart from two speakers, a strong focus is on Austria, I'm convinced that in other countries of the audience there are just as many experts from theory and practice who are willing to share their knowledge and experience in the same or similar format as we do in Austria with the Village University. Die Dorfon im Frühjahr beschäftigt sich mit lokaler, regionaler oder kommunaler Resilienz, Beispielen dazu und wie wir dorthin kommen können. Mit Resilienz meinen wir aber nicht nur Widerstandsfähigkeit, sondern die Fähigkeit, das Vermögen und den Ideenreichtum, um auf Krisen wie die jetzige Covid-19-Krise reagieren zu können. Neben dem Klima, welches wir bereits in der ersten Ausgabe im März thematisiert hatten, gibt es viele Herausforderungen. The Village University in Spring deals with local, regional and municipal resilience, examples of this resilience and how we can get there to have more resilience in communities. By resilience we do not mean only resistance, but the ability and the wealth of ideas to be able to react to crises like the current COVID-19 crisis. Apart from the climate, which was subject of our first issue in March, there are many challenges. Wir wollen uns nicht von solchen Entwicklungen überrumpeln lassen. Dafür müssen wir gemeinsam etwas bewegen, etwas verändern. Heute erzählen wir euch vor allem, warum und was wir verändern müssen und geben einen Vorgeschmack auf das Programm, das euch in den nächsten Wochen noch erwarten wird. Begleitet uns auf dieser Reise. An dieser Stelle möchte ich gleich an meinen Kollegen Franz Nadata, dem Ideengeber und Mitkurator der Dorfuni, als interkommunales Bildungsnetzwerk weitergeben. We do not want to be caught off guard by such developments anymore. To do this, we must do something together change things for the better. Today we will tell you why and what we have to change and give a foretaste of the program for the next weeks, which will be only in German, but which is mainly about how we are going to do this change and for more resilience. Join us on this journey. At this point I would like to pass on to my colleague Franz Naurada, the initiator and co-curator of the Village University as an intermunicipal education network. Please welcome Franz. Wir haben heute eine Einschränkung und eine wunderbare Gelegenheit. Also äh, die Frage, die, der erste Punkt ist, wie wir es machen. Wir machen es ein bisschen anders als üblich. Unser übliches Format ist aufgrund der Corona-Krise leider dieses Mal nicht möglich. Unser übliches Format ist, dass wir mit diesem Video-Input etwas anregen, dass wir mit diesem Video-Input lokale äh, Gesprächsrunden zusammenbringen. Also unsere Idee ist, äh, dass Bildung 
und Begegnung äh, miteinander verwoben sind, dass alles, was sozusagen von außen in eine lokale Gemeinschaft an Wissensinputs kommt, auch gleich von den Menschen vor Ort verarbeitet wird. Okay, so um, we have a restriction and a possibility today. The restriction is because of the Corona crisis that we are doing an online event. An online event uh, which um, this is the opportunity we can do in German and English. Uh, if it was uh, our usual form of offline event, we couldn't do that that easily because the main point of uh, the village versity format is that we are communicating with a local audience that comes together in a place and that this uh, external input via uh, the video conference software and the possibility to give feedback is only uh, a catalyst for a local encounter where people who look at all these uh, interesting uh, speeches and presentations immediately ask what does it mean for us in our community in our municipality in our region so it's a it's a it's a format that depends on physical proximity and today because we cannot do these physical meetings we decided to do this experiment and also this message uh, to show that this format we would like to have it applied worldwide <laughs> We are here in tiny Austria, but you also can do it in your countries. This is the first point, why? Uh, uh, how? Yeah, The first point was how. Now we're doing it online and uh, we have these speeches. And we have this, as you have seen, this uh, interaction by a text chat. It's a poor interaction. Also das wie. Wir haben auch eine Interaktion über einen text chat auf der Seite Dorfuni Feedback, aber es ist eben eine etwas eingeschränkte Form von Interaktion. Normalerweise würden wir uns eine breitere Interaktion wünschen. Das war das Wie. Um, the next question is why? Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, we think that there is a lot of potential in the local, especially in rural areas, that is sleeping. Uh, with all these modern technologies, uh, which are not limited to communication technologies, but also insights, in every way of human life, we have a lot of inventions uh, somewhere in the world made that can make our life easier and that can help us to better cooperate with the natural surrounding around us. Uh, and therefore, uh, we think uh, that there is an unsleeping uh, potential uh, in, in the local which needs to be awakened. And one way, one way, sorry, yeah, uh, to awaken this potential is to give an outside impulse to show what is possible in the local sphere. Uh, and... Um, this is, in our, in our uh, uh, opinion, not only possible, but it's also necessary. Because we think that rural areas nowadays need uh, to create standards of life that keep young people satisfied and want them to stay in their village. But uh, in order to have all these standards met, you have to have a lot of qualifications. So the main purpose and the main action to be done uh, in villages, in peripheral areas, is to qualify people to do many jobs. But uh, the problem is we don't have teachers on spot. So uh, the idea of village versity is we will have teachings from remote, and we will look at them and see what can we make out of this for improving our local situation and really uh, taking uh, 
uh, advantage of all the potentials that are sleeping in the local arena. Also die grundlegende, das grundlegende Warum der Dorfuni, das grundlegende Warum ist schlicht und einfach der Umstand, dass es eine unglaubliche Menge an Potenzial gibt, das in unseren unmittelbaren lokalen Lebensumgebungen schlummert, wenn wir sie besser organisieren. Um das zu tun, äh, brauchen wir aber eine Fülle von Qualifikationen. Äh, wir brauchen eine Fülle von Tätigkeiten, Qualifikationen, Jobs in diesen lokalen äh, Umgebungen. Und diese Jobs können nur von relativ wenigen Menschen, die sich also sozusagen mehrfach qualifizieren müssen, erledigt werden. Und dafür brauchen sie ein Mehrfaches an Bildung, als in den Städten. Aber in der Realität haben sie weniger an Bildung, weil es keine Bildungsinstitutionen vor Ort gibt. Unsere Lösung, wir äh, bringen Bildung über den Kanal, den Sie heute benutzen, die Videokommunikation und gleichzeitig verarbeiten wir und prüfen wir und testen wir das, was an Wissen äh, hereinkommt, ob es für uns vor Ort überhaupt tauglich ist. Ja, und der dritte Punkt ist dann äh, das Wer. Ja, äh, wer ist Lehrer, wer ist Schüler in dieser äh, Dorfuni? Äh, the third point is the who. Who is the teacher and who is the student in this village university? Now we think that there is another untapped source of knowledge and information and wisdom sleeping in other communities that have tried out practically to innovate and change their ways of life and have already some experimental knowledge which they can share with others together with the institutions that are responsible for knowledge, universities, but usually they are too far away from practical life. If we can bring these two streams together, if we can turn each village into a reality lab, uh, and if we can convey these results out of the trials and errors, if we can convey it from one place to many others, this is Village University. Also, das wer, das sind interessanterweise eben, wenn wir die Frage stellen, wer hat Wissen, das er vermitteln kann, dann sind das für uns primär auch Menschen in Gemeinden und Regionen, die ähm, sozusagen sich schon einmal auseinandergesetzt haben mit einer Innovation, die Erfahrungen gemacht haben, die Erfolge und Misserfolge haben. Sie können berichten, warum ihre Erfahrungen und ihr Wissen teilen und wenn äh, wir sozusagen jedes Dorf, jede Gemeinde wie ein Reallabor aber also gleichzeitig auch wie ein Kompetenzzentrum betrachten, äh, dann plötzlich ist die Frage nicht mehr, wo sind die Lehrer, sondern wie schaffen wir es zu organisieren, dass das, Punkt, dass das Wissen, das an einem Punkt vorhanden ist, möglichst auch zu anderen Punkten gelangt. Gleichzeitig äh, ist unsere Idee, dass wir eben auch die traditionellen Wissensinstitutionen in diesen Prozess einbeziehen wollen und aus diesen beiden Quellen, aus der praktischen Erfahrung und aus dem großen Wissensschatz der Universitäten etwas zusammenspinnen wollen, das äh, die lokale Entwicklung fördert und äh, uns äh, in die Lage versetzt, den Herausforderungen der Zeit zu genügen. Okay, danke. Das waren die drei Punkte. Ich hoffe, es ist klar geworden, was Dorf Uni ist. Thank you very much. That were the three points. And I hope it has been clarified what the idea of Village University is. And I hand back the microphone to David. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Danke, Franz. Jetzt beginnen wir mit der simultan Dolmetsch. So now we start with simultaneous uh, Dolmetsch. And I want to introduce, oder ich möchte unseren ersten Gastsprecher vorstellen, das ist Rob Hopkins. Er ist bekannt als Gesicht der Transition-Bewegung. Vielleicht noch ein paar Worte, woher er eigentlich kommt. Er kommt ursprünglich aus der Permakultur-Szene und 
hat in Kinsale in Irland in einem Rahmen eines Kurses zum ersten Mal einen Energieverbrauchsreduktionsplan Verbrauchsreduktionsplan erstellt für eine Stadt, woher auch die Idee der Transition Towns gekommen ist. Und er ist nachher nach England, nach Totnes gegangen und hat einfach mal angefangen, was zu tun. Wie, wie auch das heutige Motto einfach jetzt tun ist. Und die Erfahrungen waren so erfolgreich, dass das Transition Network als Organisation entstand und sich die Bewegung inspiriert von Büchern und Filmen, die auch äh, Rob Hopkins mitschrieb, äh, global verbreitete. Er ist auch äh, Gründer einer Brauerei, die mittlerweile auch ein, im Gemeinschaftseigentum ist äh, und sowieso ist er bekannt als Autor und Sprecher. Und damit möchte ich übergeben an Rob Hopkins und ihn auch herzlich willkommen heißen. Hello, do I start? Is that it? Okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody. It's delightful to be here. Um, uh, is, is the translation all happening? Everybody happy? Good. Okay, so I'm going to show you some pictures. I'm just going to share. We all know that we are living in the time of the climate emergency, that this is the time when we are seeing change happen really, really rapidly. And the science tells us that we need to be cutting our emissions by maybe seven or eight percent every year. And the changes we've seen with coronavirus and the landing of airplanes and car use and people staying at home has led to about five and a half percent cut in emissions every year. So we recognize that this is a huge, huge challenge. But if, if we're going to have any chance of staying below one and a half degrees, then uh, the changes we need to make are enormous. And as Naomi Klein says, there are no non-radical solutions left. And for me, this is a challenge of imagination. And I just wrote a book last year, uh, which is about Uh, imagination and the importance of cultivating that as activists because this is the only graph I will show you by the way don't worry uh, but I show you this for the story because at the moment we stand at the top of this enormous mountain of carbon and pollution and resource and urgently with the utmost urgency we need to get to the downward half of this graph And my belief is that we will only do that if we are able to tell the stories about the place on the other half of this graph that are so delicious and so wonderful that they create a deep, deep longing in people for that future. My work is mostly about trying to create longing for a low carbon future. It means that the work we are doing is as much work of storytelling Uh, as of anything else. As the poet and mystic uh, Rilke uh, once said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. So I feel like uh, how we bring a different vision of the future to life is fundamentally uh, important. As activists, we often present people with terrifying images of a future where we are up to here in water and everything is, uh, everything is horrible. How might it be if actually we told stories of how it might be if we did everything we could possibly do? This is a, an artist called James Mackay who draws the future. And this is his drawing of a city in maybe 20 years in the future where biodiversity uh, is, uh, is everywhere, where the city has been repurposed uh, for biodiversity. This is how he imagines uh, a future where our streets are full of food being grown and our children walk to school through food being grown. Uh, you know, when at the moment we give so much of our urban space to cars and when we take away that space we need new ideas for what we do there two-thirds of the surface area of los angeles is dedicated to cars that could grow an awful lot of food so so for me how we how we create a vision not of utopia <coughs> but of a future where we did everything we could do is really really important so what i want to share with you this morning <coughs> is a model that emerged from the research in the book. 
And it tries to answer the question, how might we set out to expand our collective imagination? The imagination is something which should be like this. It's a muscle that should be like this, but increasingly in our culture, it is like this mm -hmm. because we are failing to create the conditions that the imagination needs. So, uh, you know, I, I fear that we have created a perfect storm that is causing our imagination to contract at the very time it needs to be expanding. So I want to share with you these four things. <clears throat> and for each of them, I will tell stories and bring them to life with examples from the transition movement. First one is space. You all know <clears throat> that in, sorry, I'm just going to have a quick, that the time when you are imaginative is when you have space. Your best ideas don't come to you when you are sitting in front of your laptop with a deadline or uh, in, a, in an office with somebody saying, ideas, ideas. Albert Einstein said his best ideas came to him when he was riding his bicycle in a forest. Uh, and we all need space in order to be imaginative. So as movements, as organizations, we must design space into our meetings, into our projects, into how we function as organizations, rather than always being obsessively focused on the task. This is a project we created in my town where people would meet with their neighbors in groups of six to 10, and they would discuss energy and water, and they would make changes. And <clears throat> on average, they cut their carbon footprint by about one and a half tons per year. But the main thing that people experienced was space to get to know their neighbors, space to connect, space to feel like they are part of a, a, of a community. We often in the transition movement use open space, a technique to bring large groups of people together for self-organizing conversations, uh, which are the conversations. Um, and when I was researching the book, I wanted to find places where people were making space for play. Play is essential to the imagination, but we have kind of removed it from our public life. I went to visit a street where they were bringing uh, um, play back into the street. It was beautiful. And they, they, they closed the street, the children come, the children play, and you could see the space that had been created. In my town, we created a festival of street games where we closed the square and children played games. Again, we, we intentionally made a space for play and imagination and that is a very rare thing these days. This is a Dutch game called Spekerpupen, which is just wonderful. And this girl could played this game for about 10 minutes uh, and uh, with, with fantastic concentration. So my second one is place. We need places that provide a platform for the collective imagination. Places we go and we think differently about what is possible. This is a transition group in London who one Saturday and Sunday went to their high street with beautiful apple trees with flowers and put them along the street so that the street was transformed into a pop-up orchard. And they had conversations with people about trees in the city and all of those trees then went home and, and found a place. They created a new uh, patchwork orchard in their neighborhood. Places like Princess Innengarten in, in Berlin are wonderful as a place that enable you to think differently about what the future could be. Places where urban agriculture is just completely normal. You know, that these places are so important. In Houston, in Texas, is a man called Jason Roberts, the man here at the front. He runs a project called Better Block. And Better Block take urban places that nobody loves, and then they, they redesign those spaces. Then they make off-site things to transform it. 
and they arrive at night and then they make it into something different. So in the morning, people walk past and the place is different. So for example, they, this, is, this is a place that nobody loves. And so one night, Better Block uh, came and the next day they had turned it into this. I love the idea that we can feed the imagination by creating pop-up tomorrows that give people a taste of how things could be different. We don't always need to do big things like that. This is a project that started in San Francisco, now happens all around the world, called Parking Day, which was begun by a group of artists saying, where can we find affordable space to, to exhibit our work? And somebody said, well, if you buy a ticket for a car parking space, there is no law that says you must put a car in it. If you have paid for a ticket, you can do whatever you like. So, so uh, one day a year, people buy tickets for parking spaces and do different things. So they might do yoga in those spaces. They turn them into places for people to play games. Some people have cafes and libraries. Someone got married in one once. People do whatever that is, I don't really know. But it's people taking space to help people to think uh, about the future in different ways. In the permaculture movement, we take places that nobody loves, we turn them into a food forest. Uh, and sometimes a place can be a whole town, a whole city that can help us to think differently. This is a, an amazing place in France called Ungersheim, on the border with, uh, with, with uh, Switzerland, which is a transition village where you can see how food and energy and economics and building all, all tie together. It's, it's the most phenomenal place. They have really great food projects. They, it's, it's a, it, the, the story of what they are creating in Ungersheim has spread all across France and inspired many, many people. So the idea of single settlements that tell a new story is also really precious. Practices. How can we use practices to uh, change what we think is possible, to, uh, to unlock our imagination? And I was, when I started to research the book, I, uh, I went to Dundee in Scotland to visit a project called Art Angel. And this is uh, Rosalie Summerton who runs that project. Art Angel works with people with mental uh, ill health, uh, stress, anxiety, by using art. They say, when you walk through the door here, you're not a patient, you're not a client, you are an artist who is preparing work for an exhibition. And every year, they put on an exhibition in the big gallery in the city. And, uh, and I met so many people where I could see how their imagination, which had been destroyed, was beginning to, was beginning to grow back again. And uh, every year at Art Angel, they do an evaluation to see how well they are doing. And they don't give people a big form with lots of questions. They give them a, uh, a piece of paper with two outlines of a human body on, like a gingerbread man. <clears throat> and they say, fill the first one to show how you felt before you came here, and the second to show how you feel now you've been coming here. And it was very moving to, to look through these. And I'll just show you one which I think needs no explanation. I think for me, if we are able to harness the imagination in uh, addressing the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis and the social crisis, that's, this is what that transition will feel like. If we are successful, it, this is what that, this journey will feel like, I think. So there are many places in, our ed in education where people are saying, we have to change our education system so that we produce young people who are very, very imaginative. At the moment, Imagination is being pushed out of our education system, but it's so, so important. And one of the great 
practices for me that we developed in the transition movement for the imagination. It's called Transition Town Anywhere. And it was developed together with uh, Encounters Arts, who are an amazing arts organization. So uh, you get two, three, four hundred people in a big space. You invite people to imagine that they are stepping forward in time. They are stepping from 2020 to 2030 and to 2030 that is not paradise, but a 2030 where everything we could have done was done. And then you invite people to think, what am I doing in this world? What is my role here? What do I do? And then to find other people who share their interest. And then you, you build physically this new world with cardboard and bamboo sticks and string and pens and sticky tape. And 300 adults build a world that they completely believe in and they inhabit, and they trade and they celebrate and they grieve and they connect. It's the most extraordinary thing I've ever been part of to be with that many adults lost in play. When we did this recently, these two young men built the public transport system for Transition Town anywhere. They can tell you everything about this, what the tickets looked like, uh, what the seats were made of, where it went, everything about it, because in their imagination, they had completely created this future. And to repeat the the Rilke quote I said at the beginning, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. And when people ask me how I know this works, this is me in 2012, and I worked with some people to create a project called the Yeast Collective, which was a brewery and a bakery and a mill in the same space. And we spent the day playing this mill, I could tell you, what all the beers were called, how our training program worked, everything about it. The following year in my town, we started a brewery. And last year, we converted that brewery to being a 100% community owned business. And we raised 180,000 pounds from local people. We now have 270 owners. And when people said, but Rob, how do you know this will work? I said, I know this will work because I played it. I absolutely know this will work because I played it. And using the practices that allow us to play a low carbon sustainable future is really, really powerful work. This is James Mackay who made those drawings I showed you earlier. Sometimes in his city in Leeds, he goes out to the street like this with, a, with a, an easel and a big piece of paper. And, uh, and he draws what's in front of him. And then when people walk past, he says, uh, excuse me, could you tell me how you think this place will look in the future? And then he adds that into his drawing. He says, you just need a really simple sketch. And then people's ideas begin to, be, be, begin to arrive. This man is called Per Gronqvist. He works for the Swedish government. His, his job description, his job title is chief storyteller. And his job description is to bring to life the day-to-day -day realities of living in a low carbon future. Every organization, every university, everywhere needs a chief storyteller. We all need to cultivate the skills of bringing to life the day-to-day -day realities of living in a low carbon future. It's essential, I would suggest. So I want to just uh, share a couple of stories from the transition movement. Because one of the key practices is the ability to ask good what-if questions. How do we ask a good what-if question? Uh, and this is an example from London. So in Tooting, in South London, they have, uh, they have nowhere that is like a town square or a village green, a place for people to meet. There is one place that it could be, 
which is here, which is a bus turning circle. Every day it is full of buses uh, and waiting to be called to go somewhere else. So one day Transition Town Tooting organized an event called the Tooting Twirl, where they took that space, they made all the buses go away, and they filled that space with flowers and people and music. They put real grass down onto the road. There was music and carnival and coffee and color <coughs> and flowers. And people spent the day living as though that space was already a village green. And it was really powerful thing to see. I got to sit with my feet on the green, green grass of Tooting. And I noticed during the day that the conversation changed from if this is our if this were our village green to when this is our village green, somewhere deep underneath the plates of permission started to shift. People started to look at this wall, which normally nobody looked at, and they would say, when this is our village green, what story about ourselves do we want to paint on this wall? Those conversations were only made possible because they had a great what if question. In Liège in Belgium, the transition group six years ago formulated a what if question. They said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? They call the project the food belt, Centure Alimentaire, the food belt. They ran a big event, they invited everyone who cared about food in the city, and they asked this what if question. I then returned to Liège four years later. In that time, they created 21 new cooperatives. They raised 5 million euros of investment from local people. They started a farm, two vineyards, a brewery, a shop in the center of the city, they now have four shops in the center of the city. They have a local currency. They have a delivery business. It's phenomenal. They made like a basket for ideas. And when I met the mayor of Liège, he said, eight years ago, we said we wanted to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. This is the story of our city. But it started with the people and it started with a brilliant what if question. And the mayor said to me, our role is just to remove any obstacles and blockages to this growing. So there I could really see the power of a great what if. So sometimes we need cities where uh, we need to create economic stories where anything feels possible. Like in the city of Preston, where their economic model is to say, we have to use the hospitals, the schools, the universities, the money they spend to circulate in this economy uh, much more. Um, but the last thing that I want to share with you is pacts. Once we have space and we have places and we have practices, the missing and most important thing is pacts. How do we meet the imagination halfway? Everybody on this call will have experienced a time when you are invited to a consultation. You take your brilliant ideas and you write them on a post-it note. And you stick them on the wall and then you go home and they put all the post-it notes into the rubbish and they just carry on doing what they were going to do anyway. And if, if we are to invite the imagination, we have to respect it and meet it in the middle. This is a, a museum in Derby, which is being redesigned by the community and rebuilt by the community and in the middle of the museum they made a workshop so all the new furniture everything is being built by local volunteers and they are rebuilding the museum now and they have created a whole new process for large construction projects which maximizes the capacity of local people to connect and be involved in that process the woman with the microphone here is Gabriela Gomez-Mont. She worked for the mayor of Mexico City. 
actually created in that administration what was conceived of as being a ministry of imagination, which sounds like something in a Harry Potter book. But in Mexico City, it exists, and their work is to protect the imaginative life of the city, to create the conditions for the imagination of that city to flourish. In Bologna, in Italy, the municipality created a civic imagination office. And it works by using open space and visioning uh, <clears throat> all across the city <clears throat> with local people. But then the really important bit is when the communities think of a brilliant idea, the municipalities say, how do we make that happen? Let's make a pact. We can offer this, 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 and this, and you can offer that and that. Good. Okay, let's make a pact. Good. And in the last five years, they've made 500 pacts in Bologna, from let's make a small garden to let's take this empty office block and turn it into a school to train young people as classical musicians. So pacts is fundamentally important that we, that, that, that we meet the imagination in the middle and every organization should be committing to that kind of an approach, I think. Uh, and I'm going to go through that. And just because I'm finishing up now to say, uh, actually, I will, I will tell you that, sorry. I feel like, uh, you know, sometimes when people hear me talking and they say, well, this all sounds very nice, but in the real world, this kind of thing would never work. The privilege that I have in the transition movement is that I get to go and visit so many places where this stuff is happening, and is moving and accelerating very fast. And when we look at what a post COVID-19 world will look like, there is so much that we need to reimagine, that we need to rebuild, that we need to bring fresh thinking to this. And, uh, and uh, the imagination is going to be fundamental. So I just want to close by telling you this story from France. I went to uh, last year visit a town called Montsartu, which is half an hour inland from Nice. And in Montsartu, the government in France passed a law to say all food in schools should be, 20% of food in schools should be organic. And in Montsartu, they said, well, if 20% is better than 0%, why, why are we stopping at 20%? So they decided all the food should be 100% organic and that they would grow as much of it as possible on land in the town. So the municipality bought land, which was due to be covered in houses, and they turned it into a, into a market garden. I visited there and it was beautiful and it was alive with biodiversity and bees and flowers, and they grew 70% of all the food for the schools. And when I went there, I thought, here we have a solution to the climate crisis, to the biodiversity crisis, to the social crisis, which is a win, 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 win scenario. It's good for mental health, public health, uh, uh, the local economy, biodiversity, skills, training, etc., etc., etc. You know, this is, this is the, 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 the kind of solutions that we need, I think. So that's my, uh, my offering to this wonderful online event, that we need to be thinking about space, place, practices, and path. Um, and so thank you so much for your attention. Uh, uh, just to close, if you, if you want to find out any more about the work that I do, uh, so robhopkins.net, you will find all of the interviews that I did for the book are available there. If you want to find out about the transition movement, have a look at the transition website. And I also just started a new podcast series called From What If to What Next, which might interest you too. So thank you so much for your attention. And I look forward to the rest of uh, the rest of this morning. Okay, but uh, I, I think I had over now to uh, our other speakers that they, if they have questions to Rob. Yeah, ich wollte einfach nur mich bedanken. Also, 
I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I have been in this movement that the change that this uh, is really happening uh, through permaculture, dragon dreaming, all, all the transition cultures, uh, all the ideas, everything that uh, has now come together, it really touched me and uh, I wanted to say thank you. Is there um, any connection between those activities except you telling those stories? Do they know about each other and exchange each other? Uh, the so yeah many of those stories uh, have emerged from the transition town movement so they would know about each other because a lot of my work is around storytelling so I, I listen for stories and I share stories through the network uh, and certainly you know in the UK the word transition tends to be used to refer to the transition movement and the transition model uh, that we developed and that we use. Uh, but in France, because the because uh, of a film called Tomorrow that was very popular in France, the word tends to refer to a wider uh, body of of. Uh, of, of kind of action and activism, I suppose. So the the last story I told about uh, from Montsartu in in France, that would think of itself as transition, but it doesn't have a connection to the transition movement, I suppose. But most of those stories have come through the transition movement. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, there are a lot of questions coming in through the chat. Um, so one user, and, and unfortunately, people did not put their <laughs> name and location. Yes, 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 um, there are. Uh, one user is asking about, uh, is amazed by the idea of a chief storyteller <laughs> and is wondering whether Rob or someone else knows how this job was created in Sweden if it exists somewhere else, and if there is a discourse about this in policy. And also, of course, big cheers and thanks. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, 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 there was an article that I read about it, which uh, maybe when we, when we move on to the next speakers, I will find that article and I can post it into the chat. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a post that was created by the Swedish government, but I don't know what the process was that led them uh, to that, uh, okay. other than that I read it and I thought, that's genius. Okay, next question. Um, it, it, it really relates to this question. <laughs> uh, I would be interested in the question, uh, if it is better, uh, should be political or citizens measures and activities uh, uh, applied in order to initiate these transition projects? What should be the role of politics in the movement? Well, I think um, for me, part of the role of politics, uh, you can see in the story in Liège, you know, that, that um, the role of politics is to support and enable citizens to take imaginative action. Uh, we need national politics to create the narrative and the framework. And as Extinction Rebellion uh, say, we need them to tell the truth about the situation and the urgency and the scale of change required and they need to create enabling frameworks which enable communities to uh, to act in a way that is resourced uh, in a way that recognizes that you can only do so much with volunteers and which is based on the principles of resilience and the need to make uh, local economies more resilient so my sense is that we have to take the polit current political uh, 
uh, and I, you know, I don't claim to know how to do this, okay, but that we have to take the current political top-down uh, model and turn it the other way around, so that the role of each level is to make sure that the level beneath it has everything that it needs in order to act, and then so on. So, so fundamentally, the role of government is to empower citizens to take the action that they need in the most imaginative way possible. And it's a reason why in the book, I argue that we need to create a, a national imagination act, a piece of legislation that enshrines uh, our right to an imaginative life. Mm -hmm. um, I think this, uh, this uh, way to, to turn things around has a name. Uh, I think it uh, was called subsidiary. Policy. Subsidiarity, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's an old concept that needs to be totally oh. revitalized in this uh, quest for localization. And uh, actually, the next question again relates to what you have just mentioned. Uh, the question from the third question that I have here is uh, um, what's the balance of people in transition towns uh, in re regard to paid and unpaid labor? Uh, do the people who are, uh, who are active, um, do they have enough income or are they sufficiently supplied with everything they need? Uh, that, is, that is a question that came in German. That's a very good and a very important question because uh, so many of the projects that, that we see in the transition movement are done by volunteers. And the reality is that when you begin, you have no resource and you are driven by the momentum and the enthusiasm of volunteers. But if this is to be sustainable, if this is to be uh, resilient, we have to recognize that we need to conceive and imagine these projects in such a way that, uh, that we don't expect everybody to always be volunteers. Sometimes people will say, ah, but the transition movement and the environmental movement is all Uh, white middle class people, which which is not true, but is sometimes true. And I think uh, unless we are able to create paid jobs for people, then that will often remain the case. And I went to America 10 years ago. I met an extraordinary uh, woman working in Richmond, California, very poor neighborhood. And I said, we, we, did a, we did a talk together. And I said, uh, you know, unless we are able to create work for people, then these will always remain uh, um, unrepresentative movements. And she said, it's so good to hear you say that. She said, if this is a revolution that depends on volunteers, then I can't be part of it and nor can anybody else who lives here. You know, so we have a, a, a big strand in our work in the transition movement that we call the Reconomy Project, which is to say, how do we think like entrepreneurs when we are imagining a project? How do we imagine it in the way that an entrepreneur might imagine it? So, for example, I mentioned the brewery. The, that brewery now Uh, employs six people uh, and so I always try to think of the projects not with an expectation that people will volunteer on it for 20 years but that it will be able to become uh, work for people and this is a fundamentally important shift I think that, that we have to be making if we want to create a new economy that new economy means that people will need to be able to survive and, and thrive and pay their mortgage and, uh, you know, all of that sort of thing. So, so that feels a really fundamentally important thing to me. Um, okay. 
There are uh, more questions. One question was about movies. Um, of course, there is tomorrow. Is there other movies that can get people interested? What are your favorite movies, Rob? That get <laughs> people to start. Well, there's a film that you can find on YouTube called In Transition 2.0, which is a really good introduction to transition. Uh, there's a the the film that I mentioned, a French film called Qu'est-ce qu'on attend, or What Are We Waiting For, which is the story of Ungersheim, which is the town I mentioned. Uh, I don't know. Those are two. Those are two starters. I think. I think tomorrow is also a fabulous film. Okay. Um, another question: uh, When will we reach critical mass? <laughs> when will we? When do you think, when do you see uh, critical mass uh, reached uh, by the processes we're starting? Uh, I think I think in some aspects that, that we have already reached critical mass. I think the beautiful thing about uh, tipping points is that you only ever see them in the rear view mirror. You only, you only see them afterwards. And uh, um i i feel like one of the most important things right now is that we in these movements that we allow ourselves to believe that this is the tipping point now that we are that, that we are now at the tipping point as we get of the keep because it allows us to believe that uh I worry sometimes that in the movements, uh, I worry sometimes that in the movements that we have created, that we build into the DNA of those movements a narrative that says that it's too late and that we can't do it and that it's not possible. And all the great social change movements uh, fundamentally believed that that change was possible. And so for me, I always, when I give big talks, I invite people to imagine what it would feel like if, in hindsight, they knew that this time right now was the tipping point, that we were living through this time of the most extraordinary possibility uh, and transformation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it feels like a very powerful way to look at the world to me. Yeah. Um, thank you. But uh, another user asks, uh, uh, the movement Extinction Rebellion also uh, started to, uh, to activate uh, people for the critical mass. But uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people now going on the streets uh, uh, to protest against the Corona measures. What now? <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I think we, I think, um, you know, Social media has a has a way of amplifying things and making them look much bigger than they were. You know, in London, there was the big demonstration against the coronavirus measures on Saturday. It was about a hundred people. You know, the one it's it's not very many people. I think we have we should das be looking at the Leute. coronavirus ich glaube, wir lockdown. Actually, as having been one of the most extraordinary acts of mutual solidarity, of love, of uh, of care that we have ever witnessed, and just because a few uh, idiots uh, are amplified on social media doesn't make it a social movement in the way that Extinction Rebellion and and the climate movement is at all. Okay, uh, I, I, I wish your words in God's ear, as we say, uh, because uh, we have a lot of uh, turnout on the streets. We have 10,000 people in Stuttgart. And oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and uh, it, is, uh, it is this big distrust, distrust in authority, and I think also the unwillingness to take responsibility yourself. Uh, but mm. we cannot we cannot finish this subject right now but it would be very interesting to uh, to follow up so i would yeah. really now uh, because the time is very much advanced 
uh, I would really now, um, we have a second round of discussion afterwards. Um, I would really now uh, stop with the last question. Uh, what would you recommend as a first step for someone sitting by themselves at the dining table right now? And is there a transition training in the work? Uh, that I think uh, is the question that uh, I should answer. <laughs> okay. But um, uh, yeah, I, I would say that there is a, there is a transition um, hub uh, for the German speaking. So Austria, Germany and Switzerland, there is a transition uh, network and they, they run transition training and they, uh, they do a lot of work around transition. So I would say they would be the first, uh, the first port of call to find out more about what's available. Uh, yeah, in yeah, and, uh, actually, uh, we are also in Austria. The Austrian hub is beginning an Austrian transition training. So Brilliant. Uh, uh, that is that is uh, happening now. I would like now to to hand back uh, to to David, and uh, David is sitting at the live stream moderation place, the central place, and he will now take over the moderation again. Okay, thank you, Franz. Thank you, Franz. We will start with consecutive translation. So we start jetzt mit einer consecutive Übersetzung. Das heißt, Sie hören auf beiden Streams, Deutsch und Englisch. You will hear German and English uh, on both streams. Um, our next speaker is Constanze Weiser. I guess she will introduce herself and just give some hashtags, which are green skills, together, living and building and the best way is that she will introduce herself because she's one of our amazing uh, followers also with uh, and co-creators of Transition Austria. Constanze, welcome. Ja, hallo. Ich bin Constanze Weiser, ähm, bin Architektin und ich mag euch kurz jetzt meinen äh, Bildschirm teilen. Ja, vor mehr als zehn Jahren habe ich eine Bildungskarenz zum Thema Nachhaltigkeit gemacht und äh, kurz danach auch beim ersten Green Skills Lehrgang teilgenommen. Und seitdem immer mehr ähm, Schritte für die Verbreitung von nachhaltigem Wissen gesetzt. Mehr oder weniger im Anschluss oder gleichzeitig ähm, habe ich 2011 Architop, ein Netzwerk für nachhaltige Architektur und Baugruppenbetreuung gegründet. More than 10 years ago, I took a pioneering educational leave on the subject of sustainability, uh, or rather, and participate in the first green skills course. And since then, I've taken increasingly far-reaching steps to spread the knowledge. I founded in 2011, I founded Architope, a network for sustainable architecture. Das gemeinschaftliche Wohnen ist eine der sozial und ökologisch nachhaltigsten Lebensweisen. Und deshalb engagiere ich mich auch seit der Gründung der Initiative für gemeinschaftliches Bauen und Wohnen dort im Vorstand und bin mittlerweile das zweite Mal zur Ortfrau gewählt worden. Uh, the um, uh, cooperative living uh, schemes uh, are, are a very important um, goal of my work and uh, since then uh, we have founded cooperative living cooperatives, uh, where I have been active also as a board member. Außerdem bin ich Gründungsmitglied der Wogengenossenschaft, seine Wohnprojekte Genossenschaft und der erste österreichische Bauträger für die Errichtung von Gemeinschaftsprojekten. Ich durfte uh, mehrere Baugruppen begleiten und leitete im Rahmen meiner Forschungstätigkeit auch eine Projektbaugruppe zum Sondierungsprojekt Build Your City Together. Bei dem das grüne Selbstbauhaus Baus entstand. In the meantime, I've been elected chairwoman for the second time, and I'm for the construction of community project. I was allowed to accompany Sabre, um, also founding member of the housing project Cooperative, the first Austrian um, developer, also founding members of the housing project Cooperative. Uh, uh, for the construction of the community project. I was allowed to accompany several building project, projects within the scope of my research activities. I also managed a project group. Um, Build your city together. Seit 2012 leite ich den Green Skills Lehrgang für zukunftsweisendes Leben und nachhaltiges Bauen im Rahmen der United Creations Academy und habe den Lehrgang immer mehr in Richtung einer ganzheitlichen und interdisziplinären Bildung für den Wandel aufgebaut. 
Uh, since 2012, I have also been leading the Green Skill course on Future Oriented Living and Sustainable Building at the United Creations Academy. And I've increasingly expanded the course towards a holistic and interdisciplinary education for change. The Vermittlung erfolgt mit Hirn, Hand und Herz. Also nicht nur bloße Theorie, sondern auch ganz praktische, handwerkliche Skills dazu. Und das in einer gemeinschaftlichen Art und Weise, bei der wir dieses Miteinander auch leben. The course is taught with brain and heart and hand, and so we don't only teach the theory, but also impart the practical skills in a community, building a way which we live this transaction, this interaction. Mittlerweile besteht der Grinskis Lehrgang aus drei unabhängigen Teilen, wobei man sich für diesen Herbst auch noch um, die ersten beiden, die ich jetzt erwähnen werde, anmelden kann. Um, meanwhile, we have three independent parts, but this um, autumn we um, we can already um, I think we can already sign up for it this autumn, correct? Yes. Inhaltlich geht es beim zukunftsweisenden Leben um die ökologischen Zusammenhänge und enkeltauglichen Perspektiven, beziehungsweise wie wir die Erde durch regenerative Maßnahmen unterstützen können und auch darum, was wir in unserem eigenen Leben so umsetzen können. Um, Content-wise, um, we have a future orientation uh, oriented life that is about ecological connections and grandchildren's perspective, or how we can support the earth through our generative measures and also about what we can implement in our lives. Da gibt es Einblicke in die Permakultur, in die Möglichkeiten der Selbstversorgung, beziehungsweise zu solidarischer Landwirtschaft, Food Cops und so weiter, da wir mit unserer Ernährung einen wirklich großen klimawirksamen Hebel haben. It provides insight into permaculture, the possibility of self-sufficiency, solidarity, solidarity agriculture, food cops, and so on. Um, as we have a really big climate effective leveler with our nutrition. Und weil die meisten relevanten Projekte kooperativ entstehen, vermitteln wir beim Teil zum gemeinschaftlichen Leben und Wirken dafür hilfreiche Methoden des Miteinanders, beziehungsweise geben einen Überblick zu den verschiedenen Gemeinschaftsformen und Co-Housing-Projekten. Most of the relevant projects are cooperative, we provide the helpful aspect for the part on community life and work, with modules on the methods of living together, give insights into different forms of community. Um diese Lebensform des gemeinschaftlichen Lebens auch einmal selber zu erleben und mehr über den Weg von der Vision zur Umsetzung zu erfahren, sind wir für drei Tage auch einmal beim Gast beim Gemeinschaftsprojekt in Fering. Um, to um, experience this kind of living form and the community project, we will be guests in Fering um, to learn more about the way from vision to implementation. Beim dritten Teil geht es um nachhaltiges Bauen und wie man auch in diesem Bereich viel ökologischer agieren kann. Denn the third part, also, no, the third just, part is about sustainable building and how we can act in a more ecological in this area as well. Denn als wesentlicher Bestandteil der vom Menschen gestalteten Umwelt beeinflusst sie uns als unsere dritte Hülle ganz massiv, beeinträchtigt bei konventioneller Bauweise aber auch das Klima. Um, because it is an essential part of the man-made environment, it influences us our, as our third shell. But unfortunately, with conventional construction methods, it also has a massive impact on climate. Doch eigentlich geht es ja nur darum, angenehme und menschengerechte Aufenthaltsbereiche, Gebäude und Städte zu schaffen. Because in fact, it's also just about sustainable architecture and giving people a way to live more humanly. Der Bogen spannt sich dabei von den Grundlagen nachhaltiger Architektur über ökologische Materialien, Baubiologie und Bauphysik bis zur Haustechnik und Energieversorgung. So this um, spans across different things from sustainable architecture to ecological materials, building biology um, and building physics to building services and energy supply. Und ergänzend dazu kommt die Baupraxis mit nachwachsenden Rohstoffen wie Lehm, Stroh und Holz und um, die Exkursionen zu beispielhaften Projekten. And part of that is also different um, building um, material like um, straw and wood and looking at those in practical um, aspects. 
Und als Abschluss erarbeiten und präsentieren die Teilnehmerinnen auch eine eigene Projektarbeit, die vielleicht schon der Auftakt für die eigenen nächsten Schritte ist. And as a conclusion, the participants um, have their own project, which may already be an impulse for their next own steps. Um dieses ganze Wissen noch weiter zu verbreiten, haben wir bereits drei Symposien zum Thema Nachhaltigkeit und Wandel organisiert. Um, to continue this, we have organized several symposiums on the topic of sustainability and change in order to spread this knowledge even further. Das letzte Symposium im Februar war mit an den 300 Teilnehmerinnen das größte und widmete sich der Frage, wie geht Wandel? The last symposium in February was with about 300 mem uh, participants, the biggest one, and it asked about how does change work? Also was braucht es wirklich, um zu einer Transformation zu kommen? So asking, what does it really take to bring up about a real transformation? Ihr könnt rechts einige dieser Bereiche sehen, doch das Feld des Wandels ist natürlich noch größer. Wir haben uns einfach auf diese vier Kernbereiche beschränkt. You can see on the right some of the aspects that we looked at, but of course it's a lot bigger and we just looked at um, just a few examples of what we can work with. Wir haben aus den verschiedenen Bereichen Expertinnen eingeladen, uns ihre Best Practice Beispiele vorzustellen. We invited female experts to present their best practice and examples in various aspects. Um praktisches Know-how zu verbreiten und die Vernetzung und den Austausch zwischen den bereits Aktiven und den Interessierten zu erhöhen. And it was about um, spreading the practical know-how and increasing the network and exchanging to exchange between those who are interested and those who are already active. Ich mag jetzt nur das Thema Care for the Earth mit Inputs zu Selbstversorgung, Erdregeneration, Permakultur und grünen Städten hervorheben. I want to highlight um, one more thing, which is Care for the Earth. Um, it's about self-sufficiency, earth generation, permaculture and green cities. Denn es passt ganz gut als Ausblick auf den nächsten Themenblock in dieser Veranstaltungsreihe von der Dorfuni. Um, because it fits very well with the outlook of the next thematic block of the series of events of the um, village diversity. Dabei diskutieren wir dann, was es braucht, um Gemeinden, um, in Gemeinden lokale ökologische Resilienz aufzubauen und Landschaften voller Lebendigkeit zu gestalten. We will look at what it needs for um, communities to build um, local ecological resilience and create landscapes full of vitality. Es geht aber auch um Bodenaufbau, Ernährungssicherheit und um Lösungsmöglichkeiten, die Auswirkungen von Trockenheit und Dürre äh, bzw. Hitzeinseln zu vermeiden. But we are also addressing questions like food security, soil structure and regeneration and a migration of drought and um, many other things. Doch... Um, mein Traum und langfristiges Ziel ist ein Gemeinschaftsprojekt ähm, mit einer Lernwerkstätte, also einem Seminar- oder Tagungszentrum mit nachhaltiger Architektur sowie weitgehender Selbstversorgung durch essbare Fassadenbegrünung, Dachkärten und einer Foodcorp in Kooperation mit den umliegenden solidarischen Landwirtschaften und Biobauern als urbanes Vorzeigeprojekt. But my dream um, and um, a long time goal of mine is creating a learning work, uh, workshop um, which focus on self-sufficiency through edible facade, gr facade greening, roof gardens and food cup in cooperation with surrounding um, um, farmers, organic farmers. Und dieses Gemeinschaftsprojekt ist gleichzeitig im Austausch mit vielen anderen im ganzen Land. Also ein großes Netzwerk alternativer Projekte, also Oasen des Wandels, das sich immer weiter ausbreitet. And this very project is in exchange with many other joint projects throughout the country and is a part of a larger network of alternative projects that is constantly expanding. Und mit diesem Wissen um die Vorteile systemischer Kreisläufe und regenerativer Lösungsansätze und allem, was es für den Erhalt von Artenvielfalt in unseren Ökosystemen bzw. auch für Ernährungssicherheit braucht, um das einfach überall hin zu verbreiten. 
Um, we want to spread this knowledge about advantages of systemic cycles and regeneration approaches and everything that is needed for the generation of our ecosystem, the representation of biodiversity in our food security everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. This next one is Barbara Strauch. She is an uh, organizational developer and a certified sociocracy expert. So her hashtags are sociocracy, sociocracy and community development. And I will hand over to Barbara. Welcome and uh, give your presentation. Ich übergebe an Barbara. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I will, I think I will use less than 10 minutes to to, to shorten the time to, um, okay, so um, first, uh, before I share my screen, if um, I'm in this um, movement, in this changing of the whole world movement for now uh, more than 20 years in Austria. So I know Franz Narada very well. I know also Constanze. We are on the way now minimum 10 years or longer and also Marianne, she's uh, uh, speaking after me. Um, and I started also with the um, co-housing movement. Yeah. So uh, in, we wanted to create uh, spaces or houses where people live together with the generations. Uh, and there we started a network in Austria. We call it Austrotopia. And there uh, we, we wanted to create many, many, many projects who are uh, where people are living together in community also to, to shorten their footprint. Um, and in this movement, we, are, we, well, we have been looked for many tools. We have to um, uh, develop our skills. How can it uh, uh, work eff effectively to organize ourselves, to organize uh, all, these, um, um, all these houses, this uh, we, we knew it's so hard to organize something. And on this way, we also uh, met sociocracy. It was uh, 2000, 2010 when sociocracy came into this movement. And I catch the ball and started to, uh, to work on it and uh, some other initiatives of co-housing projects and eco-villages um, uh, asked me to asked me to, to help them how it works. And now I want to share my screen. So we are deciding together, what is sociocracy? Sociocracy means, uh, it, when you translate sociocracy, this means we decide together. And so make common decisions. Uh, and this is a tool where uh, we learned it from the Netherlands, from uh, Gerard Entenburg. Here left, this is Gerard Entenburg and his, um, most important co-worker, Annevik Rehmer. Um, and we, we learned this method from them. And this is really effective that everybody has a voice, everybody is heard and everybody can steer, everybody can, um, can govern the, the group, but not as a single, but as a common. And this method, we, uh, we started in Austria, we created on this 9th November of 2013, we, uh, we started uh, a center for sociocracy because we have seen that all the co-housing projects that has been on the way till this time, they suddenly started to be, to be successful. And it really did a big change from this uh, consensus principle where everybody has the same voice and everybody can stop us um, doing things to these consent principles in sociocracy where we are uh, um, organized in circles. You can see here, this is the flip chart for, for the ones who do not know uh, sociocracy. Um, we have four principles and this is every decision is made in consent. And the second is we are working in circles. So any circle has its own domain to make clear that they there can do their decisions themselves. And this is very important because so we can go on doing things and not 40 or 100 people together has to do decisions together. So we delegate decisions to little circles and they can subsidiarity. So this word is also very important in this method can do think that they want to do. And the double link is if we are a big organization, we need two people to sit in two circles 
because we always have an upper circle and we have a lower circle. We call it also parent circle and children circles. Uh, and they has to have a doubling. One is the leader and make sure that the aim is reached. And the other is the delegate and make sure that for our circle, it also works. And the fourth principle is the open election. So if somebody get, uh, shall have a role, then we make clear what is the role and we give this person uh, our commitment in an open election. So this is a very great tool and it's a very effective working. And we have now in Sociocracy Center, you can see also our website um, for the German speaking area, uh, we offer a program how to learn it and how to develop experts. And these experts can, can help any organization to work in this way. <clears throat> and now what is this participation? Because the, my question, the question to me has been, okay, how can we make it sustainable? This picture is from uh, yeah, is, a, is the, the idea of Gerhard Entenburg, he's the developer of sociocracy, to make an, uh, the whole government uh, from the people. And he, uh, uh, 20 years ago, he uh, had this idea, we, has to make, uh, we have to bring together the families and the individuals in the neighborhood. And this is the neighborhood, you, you see the second level is the neighborhood level and where are people sitting together in the neighborhoods, and then they elect the delegates to the next higher level, and then they are sit together in, uh, in parts of the, of the municipality, for example, and the next level where they once more del uh, uh, elect in open election their delegates, then they sit together in the, in the municipality. And so it can go on to the, till to the globe. And this was the idea of Gerhard Entenburg, but then, the same idea developed in India. I, um, I, I heard of it, it's, I think, two years ago. In India, um, uh, uh, Father Edwin John, this is not he, this is uh, Joseph Rattenham on this picture, on this photo. Uh, the Father Edwin John started, if he, he was surprised in a, Catholic uh, village, and there was so much crime and so much um, um, what's in Gewalt, this is uh, violence. And there he's, he had the idea, I have to bring them together, the neighbors, and, and sit together and learn to know each other and do decisions together to, to solve the problems. And this was his idea, and this, he started there with the whole village. And after three years, the violence uh, raised down to zero. And then he, he also was asked, how do we do it? Can we do it? And so there started a movement in India, and this is now called neighborocracy, because 10 years ago, the, neighborocracy, the, the neighborhood parliament movement in India met sociocracy. So, this is the same time as we learned to know sociocracy in the German-speaking area, started here in Vienna. At the same time, the, uh, at this stage, the neighborhood parliaments has, has had um, 10 years uh, well going, but with majority um, decisions. And then they heard from sociocracy, and then they know, wow, we shall add this to us, and now stop these majority decisions, and now uh, start with sociocracy, with sociocracy. And now they have uh, the principles, they work with open election, and they do decisions with consent, because they have their own principles. And if I, I want to show you, because here I always have them, I, I'm sure you cannot read it, but I will tell you, one of these is smallness of size. So if the groups, the neighborhood groups, are not more than that, 30 people, then they can do decisions with consent. It's not possible in big forums. Big forums need to have a, a majority, or we, we also have in Austria created uh, some uh, fine tool for big groups where, where the, the, the majority is, uh, is, works very more better than now. But this smallness of this neighborhood community 
uh, allows to make it in, with consent decisions. So every voice is heard, and if somebody say no, we cannot do it, then we will go on and find a better solution. This is sociocracy. And subsidiarity means in these neighborhood parliaments, so I hope I can show you the next. The subsidiarity means that they, these neighborhood circles, and here are the children circles and the schools, they started big movement, bring all the schools, they create neighborhood children circles in the schools. And they are very asked now in six um, states of India. And they are responsible for the sustainable goals. So when I heard this, oh yes, really, this children group have a minister for any or for each of these sustainable goals. And so you can see it in the film. And this is now Power to the Children. A German woman did this film. And you can see what happens when children in subsidiarity have their neighborhood circle and meet. They, they, they stop the caste, I don't know if the right word, the caste system of India, where, where people are uh, separated in different levels of, of human beings and not meet. But the, these children circles, they, they stop it. And these children are sitting together and they are caring for, for poverty, for example, or they are caring for, for, the, uh, for the ecological system and that every child gets an uh, education. So this is really great to to ha have seen how it works there. And we have, I go back to the to this one. This has now spread to the whole world, mostly to the poor countries. And um, we can we have one wonderful experience in Kerala. This is the southwest of India. There the um, the government um, work together with the neighborhood movement and the poor woman ne network of Kerala is sitting in such circles together and um, caring for their own income. So they also worked with microcredits, but mostly they work in these neighborhood groups. And this, we, the experience is that the women are very empowered out of these neighborhood groups because there they, they have a voice and they, they, are heard and so they together now in Kerala this woman network of neighborhood circles is a, has the most income of all concerns you have the cons concern these are global uh, big um, um, organizations who are uh, selling things but these poor woman networks now have more income uh, as as the biggest of these concerns in, in, in Kerala. And so this is really a great, a great story and not only a vision, but this exists. And please look to this film. It's really great to see how it works with the children and in the poor countries, the children are so important to create the next generation. And like here, you see, we started now because sociocracy spreads also from the German speaking area uh, to other countries. Now we have in Greece, one example where a youth parliament, a sociocratic youth parliament starts in a municipality with 15,000 50, 50, people because the, the mayor and the, the very uh, big uh, stakeholders want to have it, but they do not really know what they get because they do not know of sociocracy. But the young people, when they start now, they are very exhausted and they are happy to have it. and. Um, we will see what it uh, what it will uh, do with the municipality. And here you see a, a young uh, children uh, youth children uh, youth parliament in India on this picture also. And this is me. Um, I I didn't have look to the time, so I hope the host will tell me if I have time to speak more. <laughs> uh, and I go back to this picture. Yes. We are already very late, so keep it very, very, very short. Okay, so I'm ready done. So I'm very happy to to talk, can to talk with Rob Hopkins. So Rob, I, if you didn't hear ever from this neighborhood movement, so 
that I'm very happy to tell you about. Check. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I would just say I would just say that in the in the transition uh, network, we we use sociocracy, and we work with uh, decision by consent and. Uh, and many of the national <coughs> transition hub organizations also do. And it's been an extraordinary learning journey. And, uh, and I think, uh, and I would really recommend it to everybody. And it's fascinating to, to hear when you're talking about the, the people who are imagining how it could be used for governing whole countries. That's very, very exciting to me. Thank you, that was fascinating. The next uh, speaker is Marianne Kugler. Her hashtags are cooperatives and local economy. Please, Marianne, she will talk in German, so we will have also again a consecutive uh, translation. Welcome, Marianne. Yeah, thank you, schön. Thank you for this Einladung. Thank you for this invitation. To my person, I will immer kurz stoppen für die uh, Übersetzung dann. Zu meiner Person, ich bin Organisationsberaterin und ich habe mich 2012 mit dem Studium für Gemeinwesenentwicklung, also Master in Community Development, habe ich in München studiert und habe mich da auf das Genossenschaftswesen basiert, weil sie das Ökonomische und Wirtschaftliche mit dem Sozialen und Gesellschaftsrelevanten verbinden in der Rechtsform selbst. Und darum habe ich dann auch eine Genossenschaft mitgegründet. In 2012, I studied Master in Community Development, which is in Munich, specializing in cooperative and local economy. Um, I was very fascinated by cooperatives because they combine social goals and economic objectives in a special way and have anchored them in their legal form. And in 2014, I founded my own um, corporation. Ja, und ich möchte von drei Punkten erzählen. Einerseits, was ist eine Erwerbsgenossenschaft? Wie hat sich die Erwerbsgenossenschaft auch bewährt in der Corona-Krise? Also was heißt das im Sinne der Krisenfestigkeit? Und was bringt es in eine Region? Also im Sinne der Frage von, von Rob Hopkins, uh, what if? Also was wäre, wenn Erwerbsgenossenschaften Standard wären in den Regionen? Zuerst einmal, was ist eine Erwerbsgenossenschaft? Um. Uh -huh. um, so I'm going to talk about three points. Point one is what is a purchasing cooperative. Um, point two is why have they been proven particularly effective in the corona crisis. And point three, I'm um, working with the what if questions that Rob uh, Hopkins is uh, asking. Um, what if benefit? What if the benefit? What are the benefits of? What if the benefits that they bring to the region? What if there were standards? Yeah. Also eine Erwerbsgenossenschaft ist eine besondere Form, in der die Mitglieder und Eigentümerinnen des Unternehmens, also der Genossenschaft, auch die Angestellten dieser Genossenschaft sind und so ihren Lebensunterhalt damit verdienen. Also wir haben damit auch unser Einkommen. Und vorher waren wir eben ein Personenunternehmen oder Kleinunternehmen und haben jetzt ein kooperatives gemeinsames Unternehmen. So the first question is, what is a purchasing cooperative? Or what oh, sorry, is Maria. Sorry. Um, I think the, the correct translation would be income cooperative, not Thank personal. you very much. It is income cooperative. So what are income cooperatives? Um, there are, the th uh, aspect is that you have the members who are part of the cooperative are also employees of the cooperative. So we earn a living with that um, and we want to promote the members through that. Genau. Und von der Rechtsform her ist es eine demokratische, hat es demokratische Regeln in sich. Es hat eine beschränkte Haftung, das die Mitglieder selber sehr sicher macht. Und es hat eine offene Mitgliederstruktur. Also das Aufnehmen neuer Mitglieder und auch das Weggehen ist ja einfach. Und mit den Genossenschaftsanteilen kann man auch nicht spekulieren. Und das macht sie sehr langlebig und sehr resilient wirtschaftlich gesehen. So the question, so what is part of that? It has a limited liability. Um, which so companies can have a flexible start up uh, has a flexible start of capitals um it has an open membership structure so it makes it easy for members to come and go very easily it is democratic and self-governing and or towards the store or and towards the common good genau und die otello genossenschaft hat damals mit neun personen gegründet mittlerweile haben wir 20 mitglieder drei davon sind uh, vereine 
Derzeit sind elf Mitglieder auch angestellt in dieser Genossenschaft und wir haben noch sechs weitere Angestellte der Genossenschaft in Unternehmen für Projekte. So, the Otello um, Cooperative is founded by nine people, currently 20 members, um, including three different associations. Right now, there are 11 members who are currently employed and six more um, employees that, in, that are in different projects. Yeah. Und wir arbeiten in den Bereichen Beratung, Bildung, Gestaltung, also kreativwirtschaftliche Leistungen und Entwicklung, Begleitung von Gruppen. And we offer different services, some are about consulting, some about education, some about design and some about development. Ja, und das Ziel ist, sinnstiftende Projekte in die Welt zu bringen. Also wir orientieren uns an den Kriterien der Nachhaltigkeit, sowohl im Sinn von was wir tun, aber auch im Sinn von wie wir tun, indem wir darauf achten wollen, auch selber ein gutes Leben zu haben. Also wir verstehen uns als, als eigenes Modell für ein neues Arbeiten und Wirtschaften. Um, so our goal is to have uh, meaningful projects and sustainable and a good life. We are looking at what we do and how we do it and we see ourselves as a model for a new way of working and doing business. Ja. Und in Zeiten der Corona-Krise war es jetzt so, dass wir sehr schnell auch die Möglichkeit hatten, durch die schnelle Einigung der Regierung auf Kurzarbeit, auch in Kurzarbeit zu gehen, durch unser Anstellungsverhältnis. Wobei nicht alle in Kurzarbeit gehen mussten, weil ein Bereich, der in der Kreativwirtschaft und im IT-Bereich tätig ist, der hat sogar, also hat da kaum Einbußen, mitunter sogar Anstiege. Und der Bereich in Bildung und Beratung hat die komplette Einbrüche. Und daher sind jetzt sechs Mitarbeiter in Kurzarbeit. Um. So the question is, why, the, uh, why those cooperatives have proven themselves particularly successful through, during the corona crisis? Um, we, as it started, we quickly recovered the, uh, the society through short time working, or Kurzarbeit, as it is in Austria called. Um, not everybody needed to go into it, um, because we, need to, uh, we will have seen that the people who work in creative industries and in IT um, still have a very stable income and still go have a lot of work, whereas the one who are in education and consulting, they have, there's been very limited um, need for that. Genau, aber der vielleicht noch wichtigere Effekt war, dass wir gleich darauf, als sichtbar wurde, was sich da tut durch Corona, hatten wir gleich auch ein Online-Meeting. Wir sind von vornherein digital aufgesetzt, weil wir sowohl in Oberösterreich wie auch in Wien arbeiten und wir auch vorher schon im, äh, im Homeoffice gearbeitet haben. Manchmal, manche sind in einem Coworking-Space, aber wir haben unsere Daten in der Cloud. Also wir waren von vornherein schon digital, daher war dieser Wechsel einfach. Um, so for us, it has been, not been this, this big of a change because we were um, a homeworking um, society before from the very beginning because we work in Upper Austria and in Vienna. So we had a lot of uh, things, data already in the cloud. Um, so this um, just changed the way how we work because now we have only online meetings. Und das Schöne war, als es geheißen hat, wir müssen zu Hause bleiben, hatten wir gleich unsere online meetings. Das heißt, wir waren nicht allein. Wir waren sofort... Uh, dann in sehr kurzen Abständen sogar noch mehr in Verbindung als vorher, weil vorher trafen wir uns physisch einmal im Monat, danach trafen wir uns online wöchentlich, um zu fragen, wie es den Einzelnen geht, wie es ihnen noch zu Hause geht oder auch wie es ihnen mit den Aufträgen geht oder mit dieser Kurzarbeitsgeschichte. Also dieses Eingebundensein war der ganz besonderes, schöne Effekt. So a very um, good aspect of the way how we were already structured is that as soon as the crisis started, we were able to go immediately into online meetings. Um, before that, we met once a month um, in person, um, but now we just changed those meetings to comp be completely online. And we have and people don't feel alone because of those meetings because they can talk with each other and reflect what is going on in their own life and how they go on with the work as well. Um, so this is not. Because of that, we were in a big advantage in this context. Ja, yeah. und das heißt auch, als wäre, wenn diese Erwerbsgenossenschaften mehr sind und in allen Regionen so eine Genossenschaft auch ist, dann haben Kleinunternehmerinnen die Möglichkeit, sich eben zusammenzuschließen. Sie sind beisammen, sind im Sozialsystem abgesichert, haben alle diese Möglichkeiten und können so auch mutiger und innovativer agieren. Um, because of the way this is structured, this helps especially small businesses to um, work together and encourage each other in this context. And we have seen this proven through the corona crisis. Yeah. 
und es schafft auch einen Raum, um verschiedene Talente miteinander zu verbinden. Also es entstehen ganz andere neue Lösungen und die in diesem lokalen Kontext dann angegangen werden können. Es schafft attraktive Arbeitsplätze vor Ort und die kreativen Köpfe müssen nicht weg, weil sie können zu Hause bleiben oder wieder nach Hause kommen, aufs Land oder in, ins Dorf, um dort zu arbeiten. Um, it's what it also provides is a connection through local communities, but also a bit further apart. It gathers together people who can be creative and for, are from different um, aspects um, and from different backgrounds. Um, so it helps um, being local while simultaneously also being um, spread throughout the country in different ways um, and to help each other. Und in Zeiten von Krisen, die ja vielleicht immer wieder mal kommen und aufpoppen und dann wieder gehen, ähm, ist man einfach auch besser, kann man das besser bewältigen, auch als Region. Man ist menschlich und finanziell besser abgesichert, die Versorgung ist besser gesichert in den Bereichen, in denen sie tätig sind. Das ist, der Dienstleistungsbereich ist da schon gut äh, sozusagen zu organisieren in, diesem, äh, Erwerbsgenossenschafts-, in dieser Erwerbsgenossenschaftsform. Und das stärkt den Zusammenhalt und den ökonomischen um, so this very um, corporate cooperation um, helps to um, um, support people in the way how they work together. Um, um, I don't know, did I miss something? Um, Versorgung in der Region ist besser abgesichert, Zusammenhalt und dieser wirtschaftliche Gemeinsinn, das Wirtschaften, das soziale Element des Wirtschaftens. So um, it's, it works better with um, the region and um, supporting the region um, and it works better for people to work together as in a social and in an economical context. Genau, danke schön. Und ein anderes Wort ist auch Employment Cooperative, Income Cooperative, Employment Cooperative for this special form. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Marianne, uh, Barbara. Constanze, um, before we uh, go to our last contributor, um, uh, Helmut and the map of tomorrow, I wanted uh, just to uh, say why we chose the three of you. Because we wanted uh, to have an example for uh, all the three topics that we want to cover in the weeks to come. So Constanze was uh, representing the first topic, which is uh, how do we uh, as a community um, link again or better into the natural, into the physical systems? How do we rearrange our flows with nature and, uh, and our uh, reproductive capacities our uh, our uh, embeddedness if you wish and uh, and uh, therefore become more resilient the second presentation by barbara was a a message uh, that uh, resilience depends on the internal cohesion of the whole community no voice can be left out and the third presentation by uh, Marianne is a, a, a very strong sign that we especially need to re-engineer our economic organization. And we will have, we'll open up with each presentation uh, uh, that has, uh, we have showed today, we open up a topic which will give many different possibilities, some of them by deepening speeches uh, every Tuesday night. And, uh, or evening, and then with a webinar every Wednesday. Nevertheless, I also would like uh, uh, to encourage you, uh, uh, before I hand over to David again, I want to encourage you to uh, give feedbacks and questions, because we have very few questions. And uh, I will uh, start with the first question that um, came from Annette uh, from, from very multifaceted movement. We have a lot of uh, great uh, uh, ideas and, 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 and leaders and, uh, and uh, concepts, but um, how do we put them 
yeah, how we put them on the top of each other. And I think this is also going to lead to, to Helmut's uh, great project. Uh, uh, and I think today we have an important step. But uh, I, uh, she would also like to, to ask the question to Rob. Uh, uh, but let's first hear the German translation. I think this, this concept of a, a movement of movements is, uh, is something that I know many uh, people are working towards now. Uh, Extinction Rebellion and the transition movement and you know for me it's it's the it's the places where we it's the places where we connect and and where we share are the, are the most interesting places for me um, as I said you know when in the transition movement we use sociocracy and so there are many overlaps with these movements and uh, um, uh, and with the permaculture movements and and I guess uh, I guess you know these are really important and we need to be building these and and at the same time I think there's a really important conversation about how do we make how do we build a movement of movements take that connect to organizations who are outside our bubble so how do we build how do we reach out and connect to organizations of farmers or organized business networks or other organizations who normally we wouldn't connect to and i i almost find those potential connections more exciting and more fascinating uh, than connecting with um, obviously we have to build a movement of movements but as well i think we need to be always thinking and always asking who isn't here but should be here and how do we how do we how do we invite them to 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 take part so for me one of the one of the key things that needs to accompany this building of a movement of movements is perfecting the art of invitation and becoming really skilled at how we invite other people, other movements, other organisations, to also uh, to also be part of, of of what we're building here. Okay. Next question goes to Constanze. The question: um, Green skills uh, used to be supported by the uh, Austrian uh, um, Office uh, for the Labour Market (AMS). And uh, what happened uh, and why are these uh, uh, supports so weak so that only well uh, off people can support uh, can 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 afford uh, so uh, that's nur uh, eine uh, taking this uh, these courses um, we got the support from the IMS from the Austrian um, yeah Arbeitsmarkt service um, till 2015. And then the government stopped um, any support for people who were not over 50 or um, over 26. So um, we, we lost it as any other um, courses lost the support for, for those people. And um, up from that time, we took a break um, and thought about what we could do to continue because um, yeah, if people couldn't get any support anymore, um, we tried to reach other people also. And we organized it differently so that it was on weekends, so that people who were in work and who earned money um, would also be able to take part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Currently, no more question. Uh, so I... Uh, there is one last question, but it is actually really a question that directly leads to Helmut. <laughs> Rüdiger from uh, Obermarkersdorf asks, is there a pattern uh, how we can realize uh, projects uh, with the help of, uh, of Dorf Uni? And uh, I think, yes, there is a pattern. Uh, and uh, I think the first uh, uh, practical initiative is going to be started right in this moment, uh, today and tomorrow. And I would like now very much uh, Helmut to just uh, take the, the floor and uh, explain the map of tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool. Yeah, there's already a long time 
past now it's short past 12 we have already two hours in this call so i hope you're still on this track and i would i want to um re-invite you to join the feedback chat so we can see your questions and you can get in contact also with each other actually you can chat with each other also too so um yeah when i met rob the first time in 2013 i think you have been to the um actually i write german or english or i start with english and then i might swap to german because it's easier for me but when i first met rob in 2013 in the bowl foundation um uh, we heard this amazing story what he told about places of transition and we thought oh fuck, we didn't know about it uh how can that be and if this world is already living is already touchable so how can we make it visible how can we make it visitable <laughs> we can just like that's what we suchen can so we said okay we want to to map all these great initiatives on a map and that's how map of tomorrow started um yeah i might also share here's the you see in the back you see the map of tomorrow that's how the project looks like right now und jetzt Wechselfeld zu Deutsch, weil so here we see Austria on the map of tomorrow and at the moment we mainly see places in Salzburg because they are very active there. They're actually in the way of printing maps. So and what we see here is a flower and this flower shows the kind of way they are heading to the future. That's our positive impact rating. And we can see in detail why this why this place is on our map and what it does toward the future. It also can be a bad ranking, you could say, a, a ranking like from yesterday, and then it would like be a bad ranking, and then the spot is kind of disappearing, and the better the ranking is, the more visible some places become. And that's the reason why in this kind of view, you only see places in Salzburg, but if I start to zoom in, there, pop, there might pop up some others, yeah here you see now there are some others because we only show 70 spots at the point otherwise the map gets too crowded but now we see here other places so be here if you want to make this entry more visible just give a positive impact rating and everybody is going to see it yeah so that's maybe the basic idea map of tomorrow card of morgen i might post this to the chat so you might also find it there in the feedback chat if you are in there and yeah, what I would like to show you too is a very, um, for example, the transition movement. So we have started last year, the glossary of change. And there you find all kind of topics, for example, all transition initi initiatives in the German speaking countries, you find there really everyone uh, here, there's the map. Actually, I cannot really see it because I have such a open window here, I might change the view. So now it's easier for me. So these are all the initiatives and you can choose whatever other what, whatever other topic you want to know and um yeah that's made for example we have there all the sociocratic movements that you can map so when you have a place working with the sociocracy you just add it to the map and give it to the hashtag um sociocracy and if you have it same came it's a green building like movement of Constanze does <laughs> You just add the hashtag uh, green building. So you need only to map it once and you can put it on as many maps as you want. Another thing would be uh, local economy. You can choose whatever hashtags you want. You can create your own if you want to start your own map, um, network. And in the end, and that's the special day today, that's the first time that we really actively drive mapping of Austria. So I'm very curious which will be the first town really producing hand cover maps. So that's, for example, from Darmstadt, Wandelkarte. And you can see all their places on the map, what they found interesting and relevant for transformation. But we also have maps from Mannheim or from Hamburg. Well, and now we have 10 other maps in printed, but what is the first one for you in Austria? I'm really curious and we are really happy to help you to yeah to start the uh, um, mapping there and another example i would like to share with you is our um mapathon for future which is going to start uh, in a few days 
It's a project which we do together with the Makers Lab on the 30th of May. And we are trying to map all the for future movements. It will be online and we will be also explaining how that works, how um, mapping is going. And then we try to make all those movements visible so that they see each other. To see each other and to make yourself visible for others is probably the most important thing to get transformation rolling. <laughs> And another event which is going to happen is the webinar. It's tomorrow at six o'clock. You're welcome to join. You find the, the event on the map of tomorrow. That's the link where we're going to meet. And there we are really explaining all the details. And you also will find out how you can integrate the map on your local web page. That's, for example, this transition movement from Lörrach. They put the map on their page. So we will show how that works. We will exchange experiences. And yeah, make transformation visible and make it possible to interact and collaborate. Okay, well, that was quick and fast. Um, so um, I, I hope uh, there will be questions from uh, the panel right now. David, uh, um, it's now your turn uh, to. Uh, uh, take over. Yeah, welcome back. Um, thanks for the talk, Helmut. Uh, I want to challenge your uh, gem, uh, gem uh, mapathon uh, by, by saying we will start on Thursday at latest in Austria uh with the mapping kind of competition also to uh use these four weeks that we have with the village university uh to fill the map in austria but i also encourage all other listeners from other countries to do the the, the same thing and uh what i wanted to ask you is if we, you you want just to do the webinar in german or if we also can provide an uh, extra date for, for English, if some are from the English speaking interested in getting to know the map, uh, because in both languages it will be too difficult tomorrow. Uh, but um, maybe we'll uh, give an answer when you pro ask the, uh, answer the question that I will propo propose you. Um, I want all four speakers or five speakers to be more precise. Uh, to ask a very simple question, um, which is, what have I learned today? So uh, you, you have heard a lot of stories, a lot of great inspiration. And what do you take with you? And I want to start with Rob. Straw building and straw bale building for many years. I just always love to hear stories and 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 it always reminds me that actually working with a big team of people building straw bale buildings and clay plastering is some of the most delightful uh, and in, inspiring work i've done in my life and i and i think uh, from from what marianne talked about you know we it's not like we have to start everything from scratch you know the the models that we need to organize the models that we need to create what comes next already exist and they are already flourishing and there are brilliant people who know how to do these things. I guess just the last thought I would say is that I feel like um, as we emerge from the coronavirus and into a post-COVID-19 world, I feel like the the debates and uh, the debates will have really changed you know i the, the when you know three months ago when we said we need to build more resilient local food networks we were having that conversation just with people like us and now we are aware i think more and more people are aware that these are not privileged luxury conversations they are survival conversations and the uh, and we will be emerging with really important pieces of the answer, which is rooted in many years of experience in these movements, and that we need to be really um, 
brave and bold in how we how we talk about the future going forward i think so thank you everybody i've had a very inspiring morning yeah um i was really impressed by um hearing about the indian uh, project with social mm. sociocracy as a tool anti um poverty and um, anti-crime as a real solution to bring people together um, talking to each other and, and making them aware of the problem so they are not aggressive anymore but start cooperating and by just um, talking to each other and being heard and i do think that this is one of the most powerful things that if everybody feels to be heard or to have a voice no matter who or yeah who you are um child or youth or old poor or whatsoever i i do think we can really change because this other question how do we reach those people who are not yet within this bubble i think the dorf university is a big uh, change uh, or a big chance to to be able to reach that uh, to reach people out there somewhere and um at the moment we are just um, trying to to make that reach also to university and um as green skills cooperating with the um village university much more to to bring out these informations to a much brighter wider audience and um yeah for last thing um we are also um trying to work with <coughs> fundings and and private spenders or so to make it possible that people who are not having that much money can be able to take part also for the green skills. Um, I'm very inspired because uh, of hearing this play, the future, because we are here now looking how can we bring the neighborhood parliaments to the European context. We started also an Erasmus Plus program with six European countries and there are nine member organizations now. And we are really thinking, how can we do it here? And so when I saw the pictures, uh, so people are playing the future. So this is great to see. So I like it very much. And what I also uh, take with me is to, to the force of these four uh, places from, uh, from Rob, this is making contracts. This is the pacts. We need the contracts with the ones we are not really touching now, but I see in my own environment, because I also started a community garden where I live now so the last three years, and it was very easy because I, for me now, they are waiting. The governments, the politicians, they are waiting, and uh, COVID-19 helped us very much. Um, and so to to, yes, to, to go there and then they, they do not say no. In the moment they say yes. And when I think I can, I, I can start with a play and uh, invite some people and play how a neighborhood parliament could work. This is great. Thank you for this. Um, Marianne. Yes, thank you uh, for the Great stories I heard now, some of them I know already because I made a transition trip to some places, transition towns in, in Germany and in, in Switzerland at 2010 because I saw these places on the map of the transition uh, website and it was very great and brings me to, a new, to new ideas and so now it's fresh uh, once more. The, I'm very inspired from uh, the, the story to play it by yourself. So do it by yourself what you would like to have in the world. And um, the story of the Ministry of Imagination in, in Mexico, I think we would need such places, maybe ministries, maybe um, places uh, in, in our local regions for imaginations. And I'm very impressed from the circus of the children we saw from Barbara the children, they are discussing the sustainable goals. And I think they are very great in, in imagining what is going on in the world and what should it be. 
Yeah, and I also think that the corona crisis could be, it, it's very hard to have it, but it's also a chance to change things. And I see a lot of things are going on in a good way and the, the change is going on now quicker than before. Thank you. Helmut? Ah, uh, yeah, thanks. I'm I'm really impressed about this t technical um, work here, which you are doing. So I think we can learn a lot. But I also learned a lot today already. And it was so nice to see together the other movements here. And I mean, what if we would be the people that could create the world? Or um, I mean, we are actually we are the people who are creating the world. We are like. The support team of all the Robs, um, Constances, Gretas, and whatever is in the world, and trying to change. So we are the people who change it. And I'm really—I mean, that is just the first day of the transition weeks. So we still have a few days to make change happen. <laughs> and I'm really curious about what will happen there. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting. <laughs> thanks a lot. There is a last question, and I would like to bring it up. Um, uh, that comes uh, from an anonymous uh, user that why don't we do tours by bike or by bus to the places of change? That's, uh, that's another way of learning from each other uh, by uh, uh, going there without, uh, without having to fly and, and still uh, experience a lot of, uh, of, of thrilling things. So a learning journey uh, uh, like the ones we, we initiated with Univision, uh, is, is another uh, very interesting potential on, on what we have to plan. And maybe plan together with a card of tomorrow, map of tomorrow. David. Yeah, I was just sharing, we yeah. are doing it already in Germany, so let's do the first one in Austria this year. Oh, of course. <laughs> You're very well welcome. Okay. Okay, um, wonderful. Uh, you brought in your your idea uh, by three, Ideen erfahren. Wonderful. Um, yes, and uh, and uh, another interesting hint is by Annette to the pattern of commoning uh, de de developed now around Silke Helfrich, and uh, and. Uh, also the fact that Extinction Rebellion is now very eager to create citizens' assemblies so we can join forces with the transition movement. And uh, yeah, so things are happening. Uh, but I think uh, our time is really, really exhausted for today. And I would like to uh, uh, hand over again to our moderator to say the final words. Okay, thank you, Franz. Uh, I would thank you all, uh, Rob, Barbara, Marianne, Constanze and Helmut for joining us here and uh, giving us some insights of your work and your views in local resilience. And uh, this is something Franz also uh, just told it before that uh, the next four weeks will also be very intensive in regard to this topic tomorrow in the evening at 6 p.m. Uh, we will have a webinar with Helmut, who will explain in detail how the map of tomorrow works. This will be in German, and maybe he can offer a uh, different date uh, in English. Uh, just uh, get in contact with Helmut if you're interested in doing so. Then the next week, we will also uh, always have it on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, the Dorf or the Village University talk, and then the Village University webinar. The talk will be on Tuesday at 6 p.m. and the webinar on Wednesday, uh, also at 6 p.m., but will take a little bit longer than the talk. Um, next week, we'll have the, uh, the topic that uh, Constanze was uh, kind of providing, uh, with ecological uh, or the greening of our landscape or of our living area the week after. So we are already in June. We will deal with different kinds of participation, decision making uh, and how to make the community more democratic in decision making, uh, making planning, but also with uh, corporations and cooperatives. Uh, and on the 
last week from, from our program, we really deal with uh, economic strategies or uh, also, um, um, no, missing the word, uh, cooperatives and corporations, of course, and how they can be managed in in the local com economy sense, but also uh, regional uh, currencies uh, will also be one of the topic and also how we can have commons and also demonetized uh, econom economic social exchange systems. So be excited, look at dorfuni.it slash uh, Frühjahr 2020. Uh, maybe Hel Helmut will also make a Again, uh, a card with um, with the um, with the U with the URL. At this point, I want to say thank you, thank you for your patience and that uh, learning. Uh, also, I'm learning a lot how to uh, get village villages thrive by techniques. So, uh, no one is perfect, and I hope uh, you will join us the next uh, uh, weeks and days uh, I will again recommend to look at the map of tomorrow and get active and really to show how many things are already there because there are already many things there uh, we will also start in Styria in Graz uh, and all the other parts with a, with a mapping and I hope also other uh, federal states from Austria will follow up uh, and also at international level. At this point I want to say thank you, goodbye and uh, on spring, uh, uh, on autumn we will have our, our regular program and Franz uh, wants again to say something so I will give him the last words. ...and announces now an English version of his marathon. Helmut. Yes, we will definitely we will definitely do one. I just have to figure out the date, but um, just uh, sign up for the Mapathon, and we will have your email address and can send you um, the next date or follow us on Twitter, and you will know it. Okay, and uh, uh, one user suggests to have a vital corner in each home and uh, and uh, uh, create a place like a little altar that can help us. Uh, to ask the question, what if? <laughs> Good. Thank you very much from my side. And uh, it's wonderful to have you had all here and the idea of Village Versity. Rob, I hope uh, this is also something that you can convey to the world that we are going to link up in a global scale much closer than ever before. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Goodbye to all. Uh, I will not uh, finish the Zoom room, uh, but you can leave bye bye. gradually, slowly, and uh, I say goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you all very much. Bye bye. Okay, so we can.